Uh, it. Okay. This is um, part of the RBT training series. It was not created by the BACB. Um, it's based on the RBT task list. Um, so this video is putting it all together. So now that you kind of know how trials work with prompting and reinforcement, and now that you've kind of learned about um, addressing challenging behavior, like so how, what does the session actually look like? Like how do you spend your time? So the basic um, breakdown is you kind of alternate between sittings of discrete trials and then breaks. We'll just break isn't the best word for it because it's not a true break. Um, but we're going to call it a break for now. That's, that's why you got those little quotes right there. Um, but you're basically not just sitting there for three straight hours doing trial, 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 trial. Um, you kind of try to mix it up and make it like a more natural session. Um, so, but during the trials themselves, the structure for that is um, they are uh, done at a very fast pace. So it's basically like you get the learner's attention. You give the SD, like touch their nose. You wait to see if they're going to do it. You give them about three to five seconds. This says three. It could be three to five. Um, once you see the behavior, you either give reinforcement or you give your no. We've talked a lot about this already. And then you take data and then next trial. So it's very like touch your nose. Yes, that was good. Touch your hands. Oh, perfect. That's fabulous. Touch your ears. Nope. Touch your ears. Nope. Touch your ears. These are your ears. There you go. Touch your hair. So it's like fast, 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 fast. And the reason for that is because you can get in more trials, and it's also a good way to keep your learner's attention if it's like SD, 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 reinforcement, reinforcement, reinforcement. You kind of keep that momentum going, and you keep their attention, especially if you're reinforcing them, reinforcing them and they're getting things correct. You can kind of like keep that momentum going. Um, so in the middle of between trials, it's called the inner trial interval, that little green arrow. Um, and so it's like, touch nose, touch his head, no, ITI for one to three seconds, touch, and then you present the next trial. Touch nose, touch his mouth, no. So really when it's a no, it's going to be like a split second. Yeah, or like the time in between each trial, if it's just a no, if you're not delivering reinforcement, it's like, no, maybe you'll take data um, and then like move on. If it's reinforcement, it, say this was a yes, and it was like, great job, tickle, 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 tickle for one to three seconds, Touch your nose, you know, move, move right on. Um, so in order to get this fast paced happening, there's like a lot of important things you need to do before you start. So it really, really helps to have everything ready before bringing your client over to work. This varies client to client. Some kids are, you know, they don't have a lot of challenging behavior. They're perfectly fine with waiting. You can say like, hey, you get to draw while I'm, you know, while I'm getting stuff ready. And then you can do that. But you definitely don't want to say like, okay, come on, let's go to the table and work and then sit them down and like, oh, let me fill out my data sheets and then like, what program am I on? Hang on, allow me to write my name. Oh, I have to go get objects five. <laughs> because then you're like, you miss out on all this learning opportunity for the kid and the kid could have been doing something. This is when you're going to maybe see behavior too because the kid is there with like nothing to do. You're not presenting them with any activities. Um, so another, here's a little tip is if you're using stimuli like pictures like so say you're doing objects and it's like you have a pillow a crayon a fork you know all these pictures of objects um and you're wanting them to say like what is it fork yes what is it pillow no what is it pillow um you can put them into correct and incorrect piles and that makes things makes your life a lot easier when it comes to um I know how I'll sneak this in there. Um, makes your life a lot easier when it comes to taking data because it is a form. It's not on the slide, but it is a form of permanent product. What? Because it's something that, like, if you have, if you say you write, like, on a paper, like, yes and no, or correct and incorrect, and then you have your piles, someone could come along later and they don't even have to see the behavior actually happen. They have this, like, you know, evidence of it. So you can just go through after and write, write your pluses and minuses without having without having to do it in the middle of the trial and take time away from your learner. Um, you can't always do that because if you're doing like, touch your head, clap, spin around, you can't put those things in piles. But, you know, if you do have a pile option, you should probably use it. Um, so the one to three seconds in between trials, we talked a little bit about this. Of course, it's flexible. If you're saying no, then like, 
it's not even a whole second. It's like right on to the next. If you're giving praise, then of course you can do three or even more seconds. If they did an incredible response, if you say like, touch your head, and this is the first time the kid's ever done it independently, looked at you, touched their head really fast, you can be like, yes, 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 and you can give them maybe like 10 seconds of like tickles or whatever it is they like. But it should really be pretty fast as much as possible because you don't want to lose that momentum that you just got. Um, so you can do a little bit longer for exceptional responses. Um, it takes a little bit of getting used to as you're doing it. You're first going to be like, oh my goodness, this is so many things to think about. I'm supposed to rotate my field. I'm supposed to get their attention before I say the SD. I'm supposed to reinforce. I'm supposed to say no. And it seems like 20,000 things to think of within a very short time, like a few weeks a month. It's just going to be like second nature. So when you're first starting out, don't feel like you have to start out so fast, fast, fast. Worry more about accuracy because you don't want to learn errors yourself. And then the speed will come. Um, so then, this is kind of like the most important part, is the break. And so it's kind of important that we have the quotes for the break because it's not just a break in the sense of like, now the kid and the staff are just going to like not do anything. They're going to take a break from work. Breaks are actually some of the most important time that you'll have with your kiddo and some of the time that you can teach them some of the most valuable things and get some of the most valuable teaching in. Um, so these are some of the things that you want to do during your break. Number one is usually they've worked, worked, worked. You've used a countdown or some other kind of token economy to get them to like, oh, you earned computer or you earned soccer outside or you earned to play on the dartboard for however long. Um, so they're going to do that, obviously. It's like their bigger reinforcer that they were working for, other than the little reinforcers while they were doing trials. Um, it is, in, in a certain sense, it is like a legitimate break. If we kept our kids sitting there doing fast-paced trials for three hours, uh, they would melt down pretty quickly. So it really is a break from that fast pace. Um, but on the other hand, so while they're doing a break and they're just kind of like playing, that's when you want to work on maintenance and generalization of mastered skills. So if you, um, master skills and even skills that you know they're working on. So if you're familiar with your kids programming and maybe they have, say they have a vocal imitation or a co program where they are imitating sounds. So the sounds are like say t, say b, say l, say er, say oo, stuff like that. Um, they're work you're working at them, with them at the table you obviously won't want to see these behaviors other places besides the table. So maybe if your kid likes books and you're going to read a story with them, you read, 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 and then it's like, oh, the bears went to the house. Say, or like say, or say house if they're um, imitating full words. So you can find ways to like, you want to mix in trials that are related to the programs they're learning. And if, you, if this is a kid that you know and you know what some of their skills are, you can practice skills during the break that they already have. Um, this is also another time when you can look in their maintenance area of their binder in the back and say like, oh, okay, this kid has um, receptive instructions as a, uh, as a maintenance thing. So you can take them, say they're in the toy room and they're looking at all the toys. Um, you can say like, hey, can you do me a favor? Can you put this on the shelf right there? And then that's an instruction. Or you can say like, when it's done, you can say stand up and that was an instruction, so you can test, like, do they do it in a natural situation. Um, practice generalization of skills that are in current problem programs. So if this is a kid who you're somewhat familiar with, your, with their programming, which you should be if you just are doing it. Um, so say you're doing, you just ran objects with them, and then now you take them to the kitchen or the apartment, and you say, like, hey, what's this? And you hold up a fork. So this is just a kind of test, like, Yes, we know they can call a picture of a fork a fork, but like can they say can they do it when you're not when you're not sitting with them knowing they're gonna get all this reinforcement. So you just wanna practice the same skills. Um, this is when you can work on play and leisure skills, obviously. So this we kinda talked about this, about this before as far as using um, reinforcers that can be kind of inappropriate or restricted and make them more appropriate. So it's like, hey, you worked for the computer, you asked for the computer, and you um, earned it, and you want to watch Barney, and you're 19 years old. So then it's like, 
okay, you can watch Barney for a little bit, and then we're going to go outside and play baseball. Even though for this kid it's work, but it's like, hey, this is something appropriate that you might, or we're going to play catch. So just like pick an appropriate activity and treat it like work. It's like, okay, you got your Barney reinforcement, now we're going to do this little thing, and then you can have your Barney again before we work um, to reinforce the catch or the baseball. Um, this is when you can work on social skills because a lot of times our kids have breaks at the same time. So you can try to say like, hey, do you want to play something together? You can even just prompt like saying hi or um, tolerating being around other kids. Um, ha like uh, handing items to each other. Like, oh, can you give this to your friend? Asking for items from peers instead of adults. Stuff like that. Um, certain programs are better to run during a break. Like a good example is um, the eye contact program. So we want it to, or like the responding to your own name program. So there's a program where it's like you say, Hannah, and then you want the responses, you want the client to look and make eye contact with you. So you want to, it's very awkward to just sit and do that at the table, like Hannah, 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 Hannah. So um, instead, while they're engaged with the toy, you would like say, Hannah, um, and that way you can not have 10 trials in a row, but mix, mixed in throughout the session, which is a little more natural. Um, and then, of course, another important thing for the breaks, that's time for you to um, prepare your stimuli. So get them going on the break, interact with them, um, do all of these things, and then like, okay, well, what are, you know, I'm going to try to set aside two programs and see if I can have them ready to go. So that, because this goes back to have everything ready before you have your client at the table. So even though it's like a break, it's actually, this is like when you do most of your work. Um, so here's just kind of like a sample structure for what a break could look like. This is supposed to be individual to any client, so this is really just a sample, but this is kind of like something you could do. So say it's the same kid who worked for Barney on the computer, even though they want to work for, they never want to work for anything else. They'll engage in challenging behavior if they're, you know, if they, you make them work for anything else. Um, Barney is, a, they'll, they'll work hard to earn more Barney time. So it's like, okay, you earned it. You can have one to two minutes of like, I won't bother you about Barney. Um, and then after that, you can do one to five minutes of like, we're going to make this break functional. We're going to work on play mm -hmm. skills, leisure skills, appropriate use of whatever that reinforcer is. Um, I'm going to work on generalization. I'm going to work on skills. Like we're playing Legos. And I say like, oh, can I have the yellow Lego? Since we're working on colors and you take it. Um, if they like a story, you can be like, oh, read them and ask them questions, something that's like more functional and involves teaching. Um, so you can, so, so say if you want to prompt appropriate use of the reinforcer and the reinforcer is Barney that you're having trouble with, you would say like, okay, cool, you know, all done Barney, my turn to watch the video. Why don't, you know, sit and watch this with me and you even do, you know, however much this kid can tolerate of like you watch something more age appropriate like sports video, funny cat video, you know, something. <clears throat> that's a little bit more age appropriate. Um, you can also like use that time to make the reinforcer social. So say this is a kid, they're 19, they wanna watch Barney. If you try to interact with them, they like turn away, they don't wanna interact with you. So you can at least use this time to be like, okay, I let you have unrestricted access for a minute. Now this is like, you can watch Barney, but we're gonna watch it together. And so you can work on commenting or texting or you can ask them like oh who's that Barney you know embed trials meaning like um texting trials who's that what's that oh it's Barney um what's he sitting on a table stuff like that um so you can do that so it's not like they're just sitting there in their own world watching Barney because that's not that's not a good reinforcer that will help them out in their life um you can We'll do activities and embed trials. So, like I said, if you're doing um, coloring, you can be like, can you pass me the green crayon? Or you can be like, look, can you, I'm going to draw a car. Can you trace it? Can you imitate what I draw? Anything to work on skills. And you're going to base this on what you know about their programming because you just look through their binder and have done programming with them. Um, or another thing you can do, and this goes back to, like, using, like, making an inappropriate reinforcer a little bit more functional um, you can do turn taking. So if this kid who's 19 and likes Barney, obsessively likes Barney and doesn't want to share the computer, you can work on turn taking. You can be like, okay, you can watch Barney for two minutes and then I'm going to watch what I want for two minutes and then you can have it and then I can have it. So this works for things 
um, some kids like, it's like they like Legos, but they obsessively like the Legos, and they're the only one that gets to touch the Legos, and they don't share with other clients that are nearby. So that's a perfect time to, like, it's still a reinforcer, they love it, but let's work on a way we can make this into something they can use in real life. Like, you know, you can't play Legos at school and beat up your friends when they take their Legos. Um, so you do that for a little while, and then you go back. Since most of this, all these things, you know, the one to five minutes of therapist interaction, it's a break, but really it's more like work for the client most likely. So then you go back and give them a little one to two minutes of unrestricted ac access to the reinforcer. So say it's like, say it's coloring and you have a client who likes coloring, but they don't want to do it in a social way. They don't want anybody interacting with them. They don't even want people near them. So then it's like, okay, I'll back off and you can do whatever you want. You did all, you know, you let me color with you. I gave you tasks during it. Now you can do it. Um, so this is just a sample of how you could do it. It'll be different for every kid, but that's, you know, kind of a good outline that could work with a lot of kids. Um, so this is one of the kind of main, I know we've said, like, reinforcement is the most important part, but this, the fact that breaks are not just free time for the kid or for the therapist is, like, one of the next down the line most important points because breaks are your time when you're doing natural environment stuff, and so um, those trials are actually more important than the trials you do during your structured time. The trials you do during your structural time um, teach the kid how to respond that way at the table with a the therapist when they're getting reinforcement every single time. But what we want is generalization. So generalization, this is the definition, is the occurrence of the target behavior in a non-trading setting. So with like new people, like peers rather than kids so if you say like oh can you give me the yellow crayon that's great and you taught them that you want if a peer says like can you give me the yellow crayon you want them to give it to a peer um so what we kind of see happening over and over again is we have kids with like a lot of you can pull them to a table and you sit down they'll attend they'll look at you they'll get trials correct they'll do all these skills and then you try to interact with them anywhere else and it's like talking to a wall um, so the point is, if a skill doesn't generalize to the natural environment, like the playroom and games and other things they're doing, then, like, what's the point? Like, we're not here to teach kids to sit at a table at Meaningful Day with one therapist and just engage in trials. We want them to use these skills, and so break time is, like, when they should be using the skills. And if, we're, if they're not using them, then we need to directly teach them during those times. Um, so the, just, you know, an overall structure for sittings and breaks, you're going to kind of go back and forth. It's totally dependent on the learner. We have some kids who are learning to tolerate like three, four five trials. We have some kids who, if, you know, we could take them here and we can sit and we could work with them for three hours straight and they would be fine. Um, so there really is no prescribed formula, but the general... The general thing you can kind of follow and you should be pretty successful is um, we're always working towards longer sittings because a lot of time we're working towards like a school environment, um, like a more independent instructional setting, which means you need to go longer. Um, and we're working towards shorter breaks because think about, think about a typical classroom. It's like maybe a couple hours and then a 10, 15 minute recess. So like that's kind of where we're headed. So um, we want to work towards that. So the basic rule is you want to beat them to the break. You want to kind of have an idea like, oh, this kid can tolerate two programs. I'm going to try to push for two and a half, but I don't want to push so far that I see challenging behavior. So if you have a kid who, who on like the fourth or fifth trial starts to have a meltdown, then you want to do three trials. And you want to make those three trials super reinforcing, and then you want to let them go, and then you want to, once you have an idea that, like, okay, they're, they look like they're liking this reinforcement they're getting out of these three trials, then you push for four. And then you do the same thing and push for five. And eventually it's, like, work becomes more reinforcing and you, it's not such a hard push. Um, but that idea of beating them to the break, that's, that's where the skill of the therapist really comes into play. Um, because once, once you see challenging behavior, you, kinda ha you have to push through because you can't reinforce it with a break. So you have to push through behavior, and you have to get a significant amount of independent good 
behavior, uh, target behavior, challenging behavior free trials. So it's like if you can beat them, you teach them what they do to earn a break, which is work nicely. Um, so just some considerations as far as your sittings, like, how, you know, we have a general rule here of like two programs, but don't take that too much to heart. It kind of really depends on every kid. Um, so when you're thinking of like, well, how long should I keep this kid at the table? You want to think how long can or do, do they usually go without engaging in challenging behavior? So that's a good measure. Like if, <clears throat> if they can handle about a program and then you start to see behavior or certain programs, they can only handle a little bit. Um, then you want to make it shorter and you want to reinforce you want to reinforce their good responses, not get to the point where they have challenging behavior, and then you reinforce this awkward chain of, like, good responding, bad responding, work back to good responding, break. You'd rather just have, like, good responding, break, and build from there. Um, so you want to set a challenging but achievable goal, um, and your goal, this is the same thing, beat them to the break. Um, your goal is to end your sitting before you see challenging behavior. You always want to end on a good note because when you end, you're reinforcing whatever came before that. So if you're if you if you wait till you see like some whiny precursor behavior, then you're reinforcing that probably. Um, and then wherever once you get some stable like okay, I can have them here for like ten trials, then you want to slowly increase it, um, <clears throat> and you want to work up to two or more programs in a sitting. Um, so for your breaks, <coughs> how long do you make a break? Um, so this is another thing where it is individual to the kid. Um, breaks are never, maybe in the beginning it's like, okay, like this is generally hard for you, this is new to you, we're seeing a lot of challenging behavior, you want to give them a decent amount of play, but you're always making the breaks fun functional and you're making them learning opportunities. So they're never going to be crazy long, like, you know, five minutes is a good guideline, but basically, so if you see really good behavior on the break, you want to extend the break, and if you see inappropriate behavior, you shorten the break. So, um, the way this kind of looks is usually we have our countdown of like five, four, three, two, one. So, in five, we're going to go back and work. If you see your kid playing with Legos and like engaging with them inappropriately throwing, then you start counting down like, oh, okay, in two, we're going to work, and one, we're going to work, and zero, we're going to work, and you get them back to the table because you don't want to reinforce inappropriate behavior with a longer break. Um, on the other hand, if you have a kid who is not social and finds social interaction aversive and they are playing appropriately with a peer, then you can be like, oh my gosh, you're doing so good. You can, um, we're on two, but finish your thing. You're going to have a longer break. Um, so you want them to be just long enough to achieve these goals that we talked about. this. So access to the, you want to give them all these things and you know as much of this as you can and then get back to doing programs because you do want to get through programs. That's part of why we're here. Um, <coughs> did I write? Um, so yeah and then of course if the client's engaging in exceptional, exceptional behavior you can make it longer. Um, so time guidelines depending on what you're doing here five, maybe like max ten minutes um, if they're doing something really special or you found something, you have them doing something that they don't usually like to do and you have a chance to open up and teach a new reinforcer. Um, so these are some myths. So discrete trials delivered as part of individual, like your IP when it's like, oh, you see on the schedule, it's time for individual programming. I'm going to get the binder and I'm going to pick some programs and I'm going to work with my kid. These are things that are not true, but that sometimes just come across as, like, the way things are, and it's really not that way. Um, so, number one is they have to be done at the table. That's not true. You can continue. You can, if your kid's on break and they're doing great and you have, um, like, uh, receptive instructions as a program, like, clap, you know, touch your head, that kind of stuff, you can do that and say, like, let's play Simon Says, and you can get it in that way. So, you don't have to say, like, Okay, zero, time for work, get out the binder, here it is, let's, you know, sit down, we're paying attention. If it's a skill that matches well to, like, a natural environment, then you can totally just do it during the break. Like, if you're playing cars, 
and, you know, cars is one of the target and objects, you can be like, hey, what's this? It's a car. Um, uh, it's another myth that discrete trials are work and shouldn't be fun and should look like, well, this is our break and this is our work and it's separate and <coughs> I'm, trying to, I'm trying to teach you that sometimes you have to sit and not have fun, which is a little bit true, but, um, you know, if, if, if you can have a kid who, for the trampoline, it's really enforcing, really, the trampoline is really reinforcing, you can take them to the trampoline and you're working on imitation and they like you to bounce them really high, you can take them there and be like, do this. And then you get it correct. Yeah, bounce, bounce, bounce. Do this. Get it correct. Yeah, bounce, bounce, bounce. So it's like you're, um, you're doing trials, but you're not sitting at the table in this like boring, no fun way. You're going to get probably a lot better responding out of your kiddo. Um, it's also a myth that they can't be embedded in a more natural activity. So say you have... Um, Matching is one is something you're working on, and you, like, what's a good, obvious way to do matching tasks in, like, you know, matching games, memory. Um, so you can take a, take a regular game, or you can just take what you're using, and you can pull and be like, is it a, is it a match? Um, or if you're doing, what else? Oh, some kids have programs that say, like, which one has more, because they're learning more and less for math, you could use Legos to do that. You could play it like, you know, which tower has more, and they can count. Or, you know, you can even put numbers. Or if you're just drawing with a kid, you could, that gives a lot of opportunities to, like, drawing and books give a lot of opportunities because you can be like, oh, look at, what did I draw? That's tacting, like, a tree, a car, a kid. Um, a lot of us, our kids have um, WH discrimination or asking questions. Um, if you read a book, you can pretty much find anything to do. Like, you can take the story and be like, what color is this? What is this? What does, what do you do with a balloon? You blow it up. So anything like that, you can, you can take, you know, you can pull the sheet out of the binder, you can take it to the reading area, and you can get it done then, and then that way it's like the kid gets a longer break, you're getting in work, they're using the skill when it matters, like, it doesn't matter as much that the kid can sit with you at a table and say, like, what do you do with a balloon? You want it for, you want to do it, you know, stories, reading, reading comprehension, stuff like that. Um, it's also a myth that if you're like, I'm going to do this program and I'm going to do all 10 trials and then I'm going to move on. If your kid, if it's a program that's particularly hard for a certain kid, then maybe you only want to do two at a time. So maybe you want to do two whole easy programs and then two trials of that hard one. Take a break. Um, two whole easy programs and then two more trials of that hard one. Take a break. You can mix it in however you want so that it makes sense as far as reinforcement because when you do that, the two hard trials are coming right after, right before the fun break. So you should be getting the most bang for your reinforcement buck that way. Um, and another one is we haven't talked about rotations yet, but we do. On, we have a schedule of like rotations, so the kids go to a social group a, where they play a game with peers or do an activity with peers. They do listening skills and other group skills, so um, and they do like daily living skills so just because it's like that's time for this rotation doesn't mean you can't throw in a trial for the programs that you have like some of our kids have just like generalized compliance programs so there are instructions like stand up sit down but they're not stand up sit down touch your head touch your nose right all in a row they're like can you actually do these mixed in throughout the day so that's a perfect time to do that um you know you can if you're working on Imitation, you can work those into games a lot of times, especially if it's um, if it's Simon Says. So if you have an imitation program and you're doing any, the group does Simon Says, you can just like take data on that um, and use it for your program. Um, so just a little bit about tr transitions. Uh, kind of the main consideration here is communication. So you always want to, kids with autism a lot of times have language delays or are nonverbal or like basically nonverbal. Um, so kind of think about what it would be like to like never know what's coming next. Um, and it can just be this pure communication issue. Like nobody likes to not know what's coming next. And another issue is nobody likes to transition away from something preferred. So a lot of times it's like, okay, five, four, three, two, one time to get off the computer. Not so much fun all the time. Um, so you want to communicate both ways from the work to the break. 
you want to use a token system to bridge the gap and like ease that delay because basically you're making them wait for what they want and on top of it you're making them do something to earn it so you want to constantly always provide that reassurance and reinforcement for the work they have done to get to the break and then um, and you can do this with a 5 4 3 2 1 countdown or you can do it by like earning points or any way you want you can do it by earning pieces of Legos that they're going to get to use you can do it however you want you can do it by drawing a full picture maybe they want to draw a snowman it's like when the snowman gets drawn all the way they get to go play outside um, so that's how you do that when you're coming from the break back to the work this can be another time that often causes a lot of challenging behavior because not only is it a transition but it's a transition away from something preferred um, so we usually do a countdown like a 5 4 3 2 1 countdown um, so what it's meant to be is like the common courtesy that most people get before they end things um, usually if you like say you were watching you're in the middle of your favorite television show and then you hear a rumble and you have to go outside because like somebody's crashing into your house besides the fact or even just somebody knocks at the door people don't usually like to be interrupted without notice in the middle of some in the middle of doing something that they like <clears throat> so usually when you see parents with kids if they're at the park or whatever it's like okay yeah five minutes five minutes and then we're gonna go this isn't always the case but like usually it's a lot of the time um, so when you do this you can make challenging behavior much less likely um, sometimes however so basically it looks like a kid's on the computer and you just say like okay in five we're gonna we're gonna get off the computer in four we're gonna get off the computer you could say like okay you have one more minute on the computer just so they have some kind of warning and they can prepare it doesn't always go so well because just because they have sometimes it's not about the warning it's about I don't want to get off of this so that's its own issue <laughs> but um, we do have some kids where it almost causes more anxiety because it's like in f don't get too settled in in five you have to get off the computer in four in three so um, if you if it looks like your kid is like okay <laughs> or they just say that. yeah <laughs> um, then you don't have to do this you could there's a lot of other ways to do it you can use a visual timer um, you can we have a kid who really like just hearing the therapist voice saying that is aversive to him so we do like do it like this um, you can do something visual in front of them like we have one kid we write like a dynamite falling down and when the, not falling down but like dynamite dynamite burning down and when it when it goes off then it's time to do the transition um, so you can find something that's more effective um, sometimes it might just be a brief like okay ten more seconds and you gotta get off sometimes um, breaking down the instruction can help so instead of saying like time's up get off the computer you can break that instruction down into smaller pieces that are a little bit easier like press pause on your game close the window put your hands down stand up walk to the door and sometimes that can help so you know you can kind of be creative and work with the behavior consultant to figure out what works best for any particular kid so to review um, Oh, so what are some things that the break is meant for? Reinforcement. User reinforcement. That's like the that should be the first thing you do. Like they've worked so hard, they earned it. Go get your whatever. Um, what else? Right. What should you do if your clients on a break? We're talking about that one. <laughs> <laughs> but things you do during break. Reinforcer, obviously. You could start other programs or wrap up other programs. You like collect your data, get mm -hmm. the other, get your stuff. It's for you. It's your time for you to like take finish up your data, mm -hmm. get the next one ready. Or like hide trials within it. Like you can you run trials. Yes. Requesting yeah. mandating communication. Engaging yes. Individual skills. Yes. Um, skills. Yes. All that stuff. Um, <laughs> no. Well, we are now. Um, so what should you do if your client is on a break and engaging in newly emerging social behavior with a peer? Encourage it. Yes. Encourage it. And encourage it by reinforcing it some way. And so if the break is reinforcing to your kid, um, say like, okay, good, more break. Mm -hmm. And really, like, sometimes engaging socially with a peer is something they don't like. 
So it's like, oh, you did this really well. It's hard for you. You still don't like it, but you did it. Like, I'll take you. I'm not going to take you back to work, but I'm going to take you somewhere else. Or it's like, That's you know, you sh- you gave up a Lego for your peer. And, the you know, you usually engage in challenging behavior to get access to the Lego. So I'm going to give you access to more Legos for sharing. Find some way to reinforce it. Mm-hmm. Um, do you have to do all your trials at the table? No. Absolutely. <laughs> not. Absolutely not. <laughs> no. Um, what is generalization and how can we encourage it? It is engaging in the target behaviors across the field settings. Yes. So the same things you're teaching in your programs, it's those same behaviors everywhere else in places where they actually matter. Um, and how can we encourage it? Natural environment training. Um, yeah. Basically, it's like we want... we. We won't have to do so much work of getting, it's like, we did, taught it at the table. Now let's do all this generalization work to move it to the natural environment. But if we've been practicing it in the natural environment all along, it won't be so hard. And we won't have as many of these kids that are like, I can sit at the table and do any skill you ask. And then the rest of the time, nobody would ever know how much, how much skill I have. And the end.